We are Plum Creek Church, and we are a place where you matter. Our mission here is centered around change lives, changing lives. We believe this happens through three important relationships, intimacy with God, intentionality with family, and influence with others. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you are. Our hope is that you leave encouraged and closer to him than ever before. We'd love to connect with you online at plumcreek.church or on social media to see how Plum Creek is impacting our community and what opportunities we have for you and your family to get connected. If you'd like to support the ministry we're doing here in Castle Rock, two easiest ways are through the Give tab on our website or via your mobile device by texting any dollar amount to 720-606-5563. It's a secure connection with simple instructions to get set up. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you'll enjoy this message. Well, like, like Doug said, we are uh, kicking off a new series this month called Destination. Some of you may have read Andy Stanley's book, Principle, Principle of the Path. It's been around for several years. A lot of the concepts uh, that we're going to share in this series uh, come out of, out of that book. Well, how many of you are like me? You're really bad with directions. Just raise your hand. You get lost a lot. Yeah, you know what I see? Husbands and wives turning to look at one another. Because isn't it interesting how God kind of matches us up? Not all the time, but God usually matches us up kind of with our, with our opposite in that area. I'm the get lost spouse in my marriage. Amanda doesn't uh, get lost. I get lost so easily. Uh, when we moved here from color, uh, to uh, Colorado from Minnesota 11 years ago, I was so glad that you could visually see the Rocky Mountains because I knew that direction was always west took away a quarter of my options when it came to directions. I mean, that was awesome. Now, for those of you who don't get lost, you need to know some things about those of us who do, all right? Now, you don't need to write these down, but it might be helpful if you do. We don't get lost on purpose. We don't. You think we do. You think we don't pay attention, but we're trying. We're just not very good at it. So we don't get lost on purpose, number one. Number two, we don't know when we're getting lost. We just know when we are lost. And the problem is when we realize that, we've been lost a while at that, at that point. And then number three, whatever road we're on determines where we end up. Now that's pretty deep, isn't it? Whatever road or path or trail that we're on will ultimately take us where that road, path, or trail goes. I mean, that just makes sense. So let me say it like this. Direction determines destination. Direction determines destination. I want you to say that out loud with me. Direction determines destination. My direction determines my destination. Your direction determines your destination. But I want to add one more phrase to that. In fact, this is going to be our main thought this weekend, so you can write this down. Direction, not intention, determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines destination. Here's what I mean by that. You could load up all of your skis, all of your snowboards, all of your gear, and jump on I-70 and head east. And no matter how much you plan, no matter how much you pack, no matter how much you intended, you will not end up in Vail or Breckenridge or Keystone or whatever mountain you are heading towards. Regardless of what your intention is, it doesn't matter if you prayed, it doesn't matter if you went to church that week, it doesn't matter if you're a Christ follower or not, if you go east on I-70, you will not end up in the Rocky Mountains. Direction, not intention, determines destination. And we all say, well, duh, Gary, we know that. So here's what's so interesting to me. We know that when it comes to driving, And we know that when it comes to hiking, and we know that when it comes to walking on a city street. But when it comes to other areas of our life, it seems to me that so often there is this total disconnect when it comes to this principle. And that's why we're going to talk about this for the next few weeks. Because as obvious as this principle is when we're driving or hiking or walking, when it comes to the rest of our lives, whether it's our finances or dating or marriages or the way we parent, our education, our profession, the way we're planning for retirement, our health, whatever, 
The same principle applies. Direction, not intention, determines destination. And as a pastor for nearly 25 years, it concerns me that there's this huge disconnect in people between where they want to end up in life and the direction or the paths that they're choosing to currently go on. And as pastors here at Plum Creek, Plum Creek it seems like we are always talking to people whose lives are just kind of, you know, crashing and burning. Their marriages are blowing up. Their kids are out of control. Their finances are in disarray. We're talking to students who are struggling in junior high or in high school or in college. And it's, just, it's not just pastors who hear this stuff, right? You hear this. When you're talking to your friends, when you're talking to your family, you hear these same kinds of stories of, of heartache and how people that you care about, their hearts are broken because of where they've ended up. And maybe they're angry at God because they're kind of blaming him for the, the life that, that they're on and, and it's not where they hope to be. But as you and I listen to them talk about the path they went down and, and the choices that they made, our, our, hearts are, our, our hearts go out to them. Our hearts are filled with compassion. But if you're like me, there's something else that's also going on. And we don't say this out loud. But if you're like me, as they're sharing that story, you, you're saying to yourself, well, what did you expect was going to happen when you chose to go down that road? And that's why we're doing this series, because it seems that there's so often a total disconnect when it comes to the other areas of our lives. I've seen this in my own life as well. I am not immune to this. Somehow we think intention, we think our hopes and our dreams will somehow trump the decisions that we're making on a daily basis. But the truth is, direction, not intention, determines destination every single time. I love that God's word is not silent about this. So to help us today, I want us to go to a passage in the Bible that tells a very interesting story. And the story is going to highlight a very specific path. But it's also going to kind of help illustrate the bigger and, and broader principle that, that we're talking about. So turn in your Bibles or your devices. It'll be on the screens as well. Uh, open up to the book of Proverbs, chapter 7. And I'm going to walk us through this story, and, and we're going to talk about this principle in, in kind of a bigger way, and then I'll challenge us with, with two questions, and we'll go home. Sound good? Yeah. All right, sounds good. This chapter of Proverbs was written by the wisest man in the world. His name was Solomon. And the way he writes this story is so interesting, because Solomon says that he was standing at his window... And he's looking down at a street that's right outside his window, and he sees a young man walking along. And he realizes he knows the outcome of this young man's journey before the kid does. Now, now we've all experienced this uh, to one degree or another. Maybe you've been at an intersection. And as you're sitting at the intersection, you see two cars who don't see each other. And all of a sudden, it's like, I can see the future. I know the outcome of what's going to happen. Or maybe uh, your parents of, you know, real little children, or you remember when your kids were real little and they're playing with something and you're watching them and all of a sudden you're like, oh, ah, there it goes. Because you could see the future. So we've all had, you know, experience with that. Every once in a while, we get a snapshot of someone's destiny or of where someone's going to end up. And it may be just for a moment or it may be for a longer period of time. And that's what's happening here. So let's listen to Solomon tell this story. Proverbs chapter 7, we'll start in verse 6. At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who lacked judgment. Now kids, look at me. Solomon is, he's not, you know, making fun of you or, or slamming you. Here's the deal. When you're young you, you lack judgment. That's just the truth. When your parents were young, they lacked judgment. Here's why. You need time and you need experience to have judgment. And when you're young, you don't have either one of those. So this isn't a slam. I, I was this way one time. Your parents, your grandparents, all of us lacked judgment at one time when we were young. So Solomon sees this kid walking down the street. In verse 8, he says he was going down the street near her corner. You see, he knows where he's going. 
He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Now, you don't have to be a genius or to be a Bible scholar to kind of see where this story's going, right? In this young man's mind, he is out for the greatest night of his life. Meanwhile, Solomon is sitting up at that window watching down the, the older, wiser Solomon, and Solomon starts to hear some music. It's the music from Jaws. Da dun, da dun, dun 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 dun. And there's this huge contrast bet- between what the kid sees happening and what the older, wiser Solomon sees happening. And that's because Solomon knows the principle that we're talking about today. The kid sees this as just an opportunity. This is going to be a, an exciting event. Solomon sees it as a direction. The story goes on in verse 10. Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant, and her feet never stay at home, now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. She took a hold of him and she kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, Today I fulfilled my vows and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. And we think, what on earth is she talking about? Here's what she's saying. I may be dressed like a prostitute, but I am not a prostitute. I don't need your money. I've got plenty of money at home. And when she says, today I fulfilled my vows, what she's saying is, I've been to the temple and I've gotten, you know, my life squared away with God. I took my big bucket of sin and I dumped it on the altar. And because she was Jewish, she sacrificed an animal. And because of that, God has forgiven her of all of her past sins. And she says, I'm good. And now I've got a big sin bucket that's empty and I'm looking to fill it up again. And I'm looking to fill it up with you. She's playing a game with God. And you know what? We've all played that game with God before to to one degree or, or, or another. Basically saying, well, God, I know what I'm about to do is wrong. I know what I'm about to do isn't your plan. It's sin. But you'll forgive me. I mean, you've, you've got to forgive me, right? I know I've done that. The woman goes on in verse 15. So I came out to meet you. I look for you and found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love until morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. And and the kid is thinking, this is incredible. This is just like the movies. I came down here thinking I'd see her. She came out looking for me. And then she says in verse 19, my husband is not at home. And he's thinking, okay, I was was assuming that, but thanks for telling me. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse, and we're we're just going to call that his man bag, okay? (laughs) Took his man bag, filled with money, and will not be home until full moon, meaning he's gone for a while. This doesn't just have to be one night. And with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. Verse 22. All at once, he followed her. Because he's thinking, this is incredible. This is awesome. This is a dream come true. But the older, wiser Solomon says this. All at once, he followed her like an ox going to slaughter. Wait, what? Like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces its liver. And the word picture that Solomon is creating is picture a deer and it it steps into a noose and all of a sudden it realizes it's in trouble and it starts yanking its leg and and the more it yanks, the tighter the the rope gets. And all of a sudden, from out of the out of the distance, at a safe distance away, the hunter appears and he draws his bow and he fills that deer with arrows until it's dead. That's what this young man is heading into. Then he gives us a third picture. Like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. 
how can there be such contrasting perspectives? How can there be such disparity in how the young man sees what's happening and how the older, wiser Solomon sees what's happening? You see, the young man, he's just focused on, on what he's doing. Solomon is focused on where he's going. The young man is focused on his feelings. Solomon is focused on his future. The young man is focused on the immediate. Solomon is focused on the ultimate. And then in verse 24, Solomon kind of pulls himself out of the story and he begins to address those who are listening. And by implication, that includes you. And by implication, that includes me because there is a huge lesson to be learned here. Verse 24, now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. What he's saying is guard your heart. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Then he ends the story with this. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death. Solomon is saying to you and me, don't be fooled. That's a highway to destruction. In fact, that's a four-lane highway. That's a four-lane highway with an HOV lane. This is all so predictable. Don't be deceived. This isn't just some unique, you know, one-of-a-kind experience that only you're going to get to do and get to live. A person who lives like this is an ox to the slaughter, is a deer full of arrows, is like a bird in a snare. And like I said at, at the beginning, Solomon's story is about this very specific path. But you see, there's a bigger and broader implication here. And that's that every road has a destination. Every road is going somewhere, and it is all so predictable. Selfishness and greed has a destination. Debt has a destination. Prayerlessness has a destination. Workaholism has a destination. Pornography, immorality, adultery, they all have destinations. And listen, Solomon's not being judgmental. He's not being mean. He's just saying every road leads somewhere. Now, when I started reading this story, we all kind of knew where, where it was going to go, didn't we? We all just kind of know how the story's going to end up when it's somebody else's story. But we are often so blind, or maybe we just choose to ignore it, but we are often so blind when it's happening in our own lives. And there's this total disconnect when it comes to this principle. And our culture doesn't help because our culture is just telling us, you know, it, it, over and over the culture says, as long as your intentions are good, you're going to be fine. As long as you want to end up somewhere good, it doesn't matter what path you take. That's what the kid believed. It's all going to work out just fine. It's going to be okay. But Solomon says, no, it's not. Don't believe the disconnect. Direction, not intention, determines destination every single time. So here's a list that I want to read. And I've written it in such a way that it's to kind of help jar us out of our thinking, to, to wake us up. Or maybe for some of you, it's a way that you could use to wake someone up in your life that you care about. But as I read these, I want you to listen for the disconnect. I want our family to be unified and close and strong. So I'm going to work all the time. I want to have a great relationship with my husband. So I'm going to make the children a priority over him. I want my kids to respect me, so I'm going to fool around on their mom. I want my children to have the same Christian values I had, so we're going to the mountains every weekend. I want to grow old and invest in my grandchildren, so I'm going to neglect my health. 
I want a great sex life in marriage. So until then, I'm going to practice with the people I date. Guys, I want doesn't get you anywhere. And I could go on and on with this list, but I'll just share three more. I want to be financially free, so I'm going to take on more and more debt. I want deep and meaningful relationships, so I'm going to text a lot when I'm with people face to face. I want to know God better, so I'm not going to read my Bible. And you see, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how good looking you are. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. If you get on I-70 and head east, you are not going to end up in the Rockies. But here's what happens. Here's why we understand direction when it comes to the Rocky Mountains, but it's so much harder to see in other areas of our lives. The reason we, or maybe it's someone that you care about, but the reason we are so enamored with the wrong road or direction is because there's something or there is somebody that has huge emotional appeal on that road. And because it's emotional, it clouds our judgment. I know that's been true in my own life. That's how I know this is true. And that's why we have to guard our hearts, just like Solomon was telling us. Because when it's emotional, we tend to get fixated on the immediate and we don't even think about the ultimate. That's what was happening to the kid in the story. Now, for you and me, it might not be another person. For you and me, it might be chasing the almighty dollar. It might be chasing, you know, that next degree or chasing that, that deal or that promotion at work, chasing a, a new house or a new toy. Whatever it is, you just got to have it. And whatever it is, it grabs a hold of our heart and life becomes all about how we feel about that thing or about that person rather than the direction that we're going. And that's why you should always listen to God and your mom. <laughs> because guess what? If your mom was the one sitting up in that window and saw you heading down that street, she wouldn't write a story about it that we could read 3,000 years later, would she? She'd throw open the window and she'd be like, hey, stop! You're going the wrong way. You're about to make a huge mistake. And I tell my boys this all the time, as much as mommy and daddy love you, God loves you so much more. And you see, that's what God is trying to do when he, when he shares his word and when Solomon is sharing this story with us. And so often God uses our relatives, he uses our friends, he uses those people in our lives that we would consider accountability partners. He might use people in your Plum Creek group to say, stop. You see, I am so grateful to people over the years in my life who loved me enough and had courage enough to say to me, Gary, I'm just kind of worried about the direction you're heading. I love you, but I see you making some decisions that, that just don't seem to be where you would ultimately want to go. And it's my hope that you have somebody in your life or a group of somebodies in your life who are willing to say to you, stop. I love you, you know I love you, and you just need to know that I'm worried about you. You know, the flip side of this principle is true too. And some of you are so thankful to God for years and years of living life according to his principles, of living life according to his way. And you breathe a sigh of relief when you think about this principle. And here's what I mean by that. Some of you have been on the road of marital faithfulness for 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 plus years. And you have and you will continue to experience the incredible blessing of being faithful. Some of you have been on the road of forgiveness. And it's not because you haven't been hurt. You have been hurt. 
But instead of going down the road of bitterness, you've just chosen to forgive and to forgive and to forgive. And now you're beginning to reach the destination that ha happens when you become a grace-filled, forgiving person. Others of you have been on the, the road of financial responsibility or now maybe it's a recent decision, but you've chosen to get on that road. You've chosen to live beneath your means. You've shopped or you are shopping at discount stores. You've driven used cars. You've lived smaller and stayed out of debt or have gotten out of debt. And God didn't bless you overnight for those decisions, but you have chosen a road that has a predetermined positive outcome. So here's two questions that we all need to answer. We need to answer them now, and it's likely that we will need to answer these at various times in our lives. As you think about the direction you're heading financially, or in your marriage, or in your dating relationships, or the way that you're taking care of your health. As you think about uh, the roads that you're on morally, professionally, educationally, as you think about the roads or the paths, those directions that you're on, is it really going to get you where you ultimately want to be? And just be brutally honest with yourself, and I'll be brutally honest with myself. Is the road I'm on going to get me where I ultimately want to be? You can write that down. Here's maybe a better way to ask it. If someone else looked at the direction you're heading, would they see something that you're not seeing? Would they be able to offer a different perspective, one that isn't blinded, one that isn't clouded by emotions? And that leads me to the second question. Has someone in your life tried to warn you about the road you're on? Has someone tried to lovingly point out to you the future that they see coming? And they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm worried about you. And maybe you just blew them off. Maybe you just thought, you know what? That's not going to happen to me. I'm smarter than that. I'm better than that. that, that that's not going to happen. I don't know what they're talking about. And I would say, and Solomon would say, and God would say, and your mom would say, don't be fooled. Every road has a destination. So two questions to answer this week. So write them down and talk about them. Talk about them with a spouse. Talk about them with a friend. Is the road I'm on going to get me where I ultimately want to be? And has someone in my life tried to warn me about the road I'm on? Would you join me in allowing the simple truth of this principle to settle in over our lives? And let's ask God to give us the clear insight to see where we really are and where we're really heading, and if necessary, the courage to listen and the courage to change our direction. And would you pray with me? And Father, I just thank you that a principle that Solomon gave us 3,000 years ago is still so incredibly relevant today. But God, that's just how you are. That's how your word is. And Father, I thank you that you are such an incredible, loving God. And for those of us here who call you Heavenly Father, we, we want to honor you with the directions we're going. So in the way that you do, in that gentle, nudging way by your Holy Spirit, show us where we're getting off track. Show us the roads that we're on that ultimately aren't going to lead us to where you want us to go. And Father, I know there's people in this room today that someone in their life has been warning them. And maybe for the first time they're realizing, you know what? 
they're right. And they care enough to be giving me that warning. And I need to do something about it. I need to listen. I need to start making some adjustments in my life. God, thank you that you love us so much, that you don't want us on roads that lead to nowhere or on roads that lead to destruction. And Father, if there is anyone here today who has never gotten on your road, the road that leads to abundant life, the road that leads to eternal life with you in heaven, I pray that today's the day. And as your son Jesus told us, he said, broad is the road that leads to destruction. And there are so many people that are on it. But narrow is the road that leads to true life and only a few find it. And if in your heart, you're just kind of realizing, I, I need to get on that road. I need to be on that narrow road. In your own words, you can just tell God, that's what you want to do. You just say you're sorry for, for kind of leaving him out of your life and going in a, in a direction that isn't honoring to him. And I just need to tell you that God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you so that all of your sins, past, present, future, all of your sins could be forgiven forever. And then God brought him back to life so that abundant life could be known today and eternal life could be known forever. And all you have to do is say, God, I want that. I believe that. And just ask him to come into your life and change you. Father, thank you again for your love. We pray as we leave here today that we will be constantly reminded and constantly wrestling with the truth of being on your road and being on the roads that will ultimately honor you. We love you, Father. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.